When it comes to the question of who is the most evil character we encounter in Elden Ring, there is only one true answer. Many characters we encounter as antagonists live within their own set of beliefs that may run counter to ours, and we would consider them evil, such as Gideon Ofnir or Rightguard the Lord of Blasphemy. However, each of them sees a justification to their own actions. This ranges from perpetuating the status quo to trying to overturn the influence of the greater will and usher in a new age for the lands between. While every faction is seen as a villain to someone, who is evil is largely a matter of interpretation. There is, of course, an exception to this idea, and he is the topic of our final spooky lore video for October. Today, we discuss the loathsome Dung Eater, his motivations, and the purpose of the Seedbed Curse. Like and subscribe if you've been enjoying the Elden Lore series, and let's begin our exploration into the depraved mind of the most vile tarnish to ever walk the lands between. To understand the loathsome Dung Eater, we first need to understand his goals. The Omen Helm gives us background on who he was. A malformed helm resembling an omen with its horns cut off, worn by the Dung Eater. Their form is a vision of the landscape of his mind, and of his appearance as he wished to see it. The heart of an omen without the body to match. Could there be any crueler existence? What does it matter then, if the curse claims all? So we see that the Dung Eater has an obsession with the omen, those who were cursed with horns due to being touched by the primordial crucible at birth. It's important to consider that the omen were once seen as blessed due to their strength, and they did not come to be referred to as cursed until Marika established the Golden Order. The Ur Tree creates a cycle of reincarnation where souls return to its roots to be born again. However, the Omen cannot return to the Ur Tree due to their connection to the Primordial Crucible, so it stands to reason that the Golden Order would see them as an impure form of life, untouched by grace, and unable to interact with its god. The Dung Eater wished to be an omen, to wield their strength, but was born a tarnished, so his goal is to bring the blessing of becoming an omen to others. Upon meeting the Dung Eater for the first time at the Round Table Hold, he says to us, Have you ever felt the curse? With your whole being, the pox upon life itself, feared and despised by all. The reviled blessing. <laughs> Apparently not. You are but a lamb. As strange as a defilement. Ignorant of your own ignorance. You no longer interest me. I've been long without peace. Don't spoil my quietude. I asked you not to disturb me. Be thankful of the whole serenity. It is all that keeps your death and defilement at bay. His talk of defilement is aggressive at the very least, and he makes it clear that he is no friend to our tarnished. If we speak with our companion, Blackguard Big Bogart, he tells us about his experience with the Dung Eater. There's something I should probably tell you. The word of the Dung Eater. He's a madman. Has it out for everyone. Curses him goes round in his rank armor and all. You see him though. Stay well away. I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first hand. He's a god forsaken monster. Not just some petty dog like me. He's a killer. Kills people and curses the souls. Does all sorts of shit to the corpses to keep them cursed forever. I ain't seen nothing more disgusting in all my years. I've never been more scared than you. Rooted to the bloody spot while he did that to my friend. We don't get an explanation of what he does to people in order to curse them, but when we find our first seedbed curse, we see what's left of his handiwork. In Landell, we can find a corpse sitting in a chair with a bloody rag over its lap, and on it, we find a seedbed curse. This item is described as a curse grown on a corpse killed and defiled by the Dung Eater. A tender pox afflicted with omen horns. The Dung Eater cultivates the seedbed curse on corpses. 
By doing so, he prevents dead souls returning to the Ur Tree, leaving them forever cursed. One of the most loathsome things found in the lands between. The game does not tell us exactly how these seedbed curses are formed, but thanks to Zuli the Witch, we have an idea from Software's intent, and it circles back to how the Dung Eater received his name. In Japanese lore, the soul is housed within an organ known as the Shirikodama, and this organ is found in a particular place in the body. The Dung Eater likely tears this organ from his victim's bodies, explaining the bloodied lap cloth, and consumes it, preventing their soul from ever returning to the Earth Tree. Interestingly, something Roderica tells us when the Dung Eater arrives in the hold bolsters this theory. She says, I need to warn you about something. A little while ago, someone started lurking in the wing on the opposite side of the round table, and I can hear, from all the way over there, the howling and wailing of spirits in fear of a curse. I can even hear the repulsive twisted malice in itself. A plethora of spirits in an unceasing cacophony. I can't even imagine. How much suffering inflicted to who knows how many souls. Not even the grafting caused anything like this to happen. You should keep your distance. I know you're strong, but please. This implies that Roderica can hear the souls eaten by the Dung Eater screaming out in agony, severed from the cycle of rebirth. This explains why the seedbed curse grows on the corpses of those he defiles, and why the curse itself seems to have horns reminiscent of the omen. Should we talk to the Dung Eater after we find our first seedbed curse, his dialogue changes. No. Wait. You have felt the curse. I can smell it on you. The box, yet tender. Apparently my seed bed is ripe and waiting. It was a brief respite, I must say. Go and unshackle my corporeal flesh, trapped in the sewer jail below the capital. I can kill you and defile your corpse. Then the pox will truly be your own. By obtaining a seedbed curse, he may see us as a like-minded individual, someone who may embrace defilement. When we find his physical body in the sewers of Landell, he's screaming to let him out. He must eat more and defile more, everything that matters to us for generations to come. We can then tell him to leave his jail, and instead of thanking us, he continues. Who are you? again and defile each corpse with care just to be sure that when they're reborn they'll be cursed along with their children and their children's children for all time to come we can then travel to the outer moat of Landell to face him in battle but there's an unwelcome surprise as well the Dung Eater has defiled our friend, Big Bogart. Fortunately, it seems he's not dead yet, so Dung Eater has likely not finished cursing him by consuming his soul. Unfortunately, he does die in front of us, and we are forced to stave off the Dung Eater's attack. He wields the Sword of Milos, which is described as a sinister greatsword fashioned from a giant's backbone, meets out wounds like a lopsided saw blade, Milos was undersized for a giant, and was viewed as sullied and terribly grotesque. Dung Eater likely feels a connection with his weapon much in the same way he does with the Omen, strength and deformity. We can defeat the Dung Eater to take the sword for ourselves, and this likely also keeps Bogart from being fully cursed, as his soul is never eaten. After his invasion, we can speak with the Dung Eater again. There you are. You warded off my blessing, despite the curse stirring within you. No one has succeeded in that before. How? I thought. Then it hit me that you are, in fact, me. And I am the Dung Eater. It is my flesh that must receive the blessing. Give me your blessing. 
blessing. Defile my flesh with the seed bed curse. Again and again. Until it is done. Until a cursed ring coalesces. And may one day defile order itself. Countless I have killed. And countless I have defiled. And soon the fruits will be born. Hundreds will be reborn cursed. And they'll bear thousands of cursed children. Who bear tens of thousands more. A few of those will be born just like me. And they'll kill and defile and bless in my stead. The rotten fools. My fate was the grandest. Most brilliant of them all. My corporeal flesh lies in the sewer jail beneath the capital. Give it your blessing. Defile my flesh with the seedbed curse until a curse ring coalesces that may one day defile order itself. Again, Dung Eater sees a form of kinship between us. Our tarnish can carry the seedbed curse without succumbing to it, which in his mind shows that he's found someone worthy of helping him complete his quest. He wants us to collect five seedbed curses and defile him with them, thus infusing his soul and all the souls within him with the curse and forming the mending rune of the fell curse. If we do as the Dung Eater said, he cries out in agony and anticipation. We are then left with his mending rune. The rune itself is described as a loathsome rune gestated by the Dung Eater, used to restore the fractured Elden Ring when brandished by the Elden Lord. The reviled curse will last eternally, and the world's children, grandchildren, and every generation hence will be its pustules. If order is defiled entirely, defilement is defilement no more and for every curse, a cursed blessing. So by using this rune, we then return all of the souls eaten by the Dung Eater to the Ur Tree. However, when they are reborn, they will come back as Omen, disconnected from the tree. If the cycle of defilement persists, and Dung Eater's prophecy of others like himself comes true, then eventually, all of the land will be defiled and the omen will be all that is left. Interestingly, this means that eventually, given enough time and generations, the ur tree itself will wither and die, unable to feed on the souls of omens. The branches will wither to nothing, breaking the greater will's hold on the lands between. The Dung Eater's ultimate goal is interesting because it would essentially reset the mindset of those living in the lands between. The blessing of being born an omen, which then became a curse in the eyes of the Golden Order, would then become the norm. This begs the question, if everyone is born an omen, is being an omen truly a curse, or just the next progression of life in the lands between? While the outcome of his plans may be understandable, even preferable to some players who wish to see the persecution of the omens come to an end, the means by which the Dung Eater pursues his goals are vile, brutal, loathsome, and evil. He spreads his curse across the lands between, even in areas he should not be able to reach, such as the Brace of the Halig Tree, 
and he leaves pain and suffering in his wake. While removing the greater will and stopping the persecution of those with ties to the primordial crucible may lead to a better future, the defilement with which he tries to achieve his goals speaks to the inherent madness and evil lurking within the Dung Eater. Does he truly care about the Omen, or does he simply want to spread his curse to as many as possible? That is for you to decide, as future Elden Lord. Thank you for joining us for our dissection of the Loathsome Dung Eater, and throughout the month of October while we focused on spooky lore across the lands between. Leave a comment letting us know what you thought of the Dung Eater's plan. Did you side with him, or did you fight back against the defilement? Join us again as we explore the lands between and dive into the lore of its inhabitants. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore.